today. Praise God. What, a, what an awesome God that we serve. Does anybody just want to stand up and say, I give him glory, I give him praise. Anybody? I'm going to give you that opportunity. If not, then you're just going to have to sit and listen to me preach. Yes. It is beautiful. And ah, he is our Elohim, isn't he? That's that Hebrew word, our creator. Our creator. Praise God. Or has reference to all of that. Anybody else? Okay. Praise God. Let's turn in our Bibles again this morning as we continue on in our series. And we're getting very close to where we will begin to talk about the armor, which we will today, but not in a particular sense as far as the individual components of. And so I'm still trying to decide uh, whether to deal with each one of them, as I said, with one, one message or kind of maybe put a couple or three together. I'm not sure. Uh, it's, uh, there's just so much there. But let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to begin our reading again at verse... 10, and we're going to read down 2 and through verse 13 today. As we normally have done, we have read verse 14 last week, I believe. But I trust that as we repeat the reading of these, that you will begin to get even a tighter grip upon the points that we have made and how that Paul is bringing them out. So, God bless you for standing in honor of the word of the Lord here today. So, uh, it turn uh, into the word of the Lord here today. Ephesians 6 and beginning at verse 10. Finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies, the, uh, the attacks of the devil. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against rulers of the darkness of the world and against wicked spirits or spiritual wickedness in, in high places, this, this organized army and angels of the devil. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all or rather having overcome all stand stand praise God somebody say amen, amen. You may be seated here today. Well, obviously, we're still talking about our title that we have given unto this particular text and this particular series. We are in, in it to win it. Praise God. We're in it to win it. No other reason. And, and God knows that he wants us to win it. And so we've been uh, talking about this spiritual warfare that we all are involved in. And so up until this juncture, I'll, I'll give it to you right now and then we'll talk about it a little further. But, but we've talked about the adversary, the enemy, the devil. We've talked about last week our assignment. And now today we're going to move on and we're going to talk about our armor. Our armor. 
I've been thinking in my mind and in the military terms and we as recruits of the Lord standing before that old seasoned soldier of the Lord, the Apostle Paul that had been in so many skirmishes and battles and uh, left for dead once but yet overcame in every situation and we are listening intently to what he has to say and he has been giving us some wonderful information as well as intelligence concerning our adversary the devil and when he attacks where he attacks how he attacks etc etc he's given to us that particular assignment and, and mission that the Lord has given to every one of us as a child of God. And although the particular destiny for all of us is different, yet the, and, and the spiritual military maneuvers are many, yet really you can describe our destiny and our mission and our purpose of what God wants us to do and fulfill in this military spiritual mission, it can be summed up in one word, and that is simply stand. Stand. He wants us to oppose the enemy. He wants us to not give up what God has already given. He wants us to stand our ground and not compromise one iota of the word of God and of the things of the Lord. Uh, he wants us to go on the offense as we stand against him and uh, attack the enemy and uh, his weapons and his strongholds even before we are attacked from him and he wants us to overcome and having overcome all be able to understand to be able to stand and to be able to be there so I'm thankful though that when God sends us out on our assignment and when he sends us out on this mission that he does not send us empty handed he does not send us unprepared, unprotected, or unarmed. He has given us the, ne the necessary armament as well as the necessary artillery that's in that armament that when the smoke is cleared and when the dust has settled and when all of the horrific and horrendous sounds of war have been silenced that it is you and I that have our left standing. And there we stand having overcome everything, every attack in every way imaginable that the devil has brought against us. So the Lord is saying, yes, I want to inform you about your enemy. I want you to understand clearly your your assignment but now I want you to know that I have given you everything that you need to ensure that you are more than a conqueror for and with your Lord Jesus Christ now the day is we take a look and we we introduce this armor like I said Instead of looking at the individual pieces of the armor, I want to go back and I, I want us to focus on seven words as it's found there in verse 11. It may be seven simple words, but I want us to dissect this little portion of Scripture and I want us to hang on every word. I want us to see it and to know it and uh, then it's going to speak volumes to us. And what I'm talking about, here's what I want to mention today. Verse 11, that first phrase, put on the whole armor of God. Put on 
the whole armor of God. Now the first thing that I want to see as we slice just a little bit off of this, this here so that we can chew on it and digest it and, and understand it, I want to look first of all at the practical application of our armor. Did you notice what Paul said? He said, put on. In the other phrase, in verse 13, it's basically the same thing, but he says, take unto yourself. You, you reach out there and lay hold of it. And then you take it to yourself and, and you practically apply it to your individual person. So here's what I, what I, what I want us to see is that, that I've said this before, but, but any time in the English language or in speaking or, or in reading or in, in the Word of God, that when the subject of a sentence is not supplied, it is inferred. When, when the, the noun is not given and it is not there. Notice he simply says, put on the whole armor of God. But it is inferred that it is you. You put on the whole armor of God. And so Paul is speaking to those uh, in Ephesus of that day, but the Word of God, he's speaking to all of us here this morning. And he's saying, you rich gold eyes, and you personally apply. You personally lay hold of it, and you personally put it on. And so here's, here's the real two points that I want us to notice in this. The personal application of this armor is number one, God is going to make the armor available to us, but he is not going to put it on for us. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not like salvation, that when we get saved by God's grace and, and He imputes His righteousness into us and declares us uh, justified just as if we had never ever sinned. You see, that is a total work of God. There is nothing that we can do. There is nothing that we can improve. It is all God's grace and God's love and God's mercy. It's all what God does for us. But here in this text, he says, hey, there is a part that you must play. So I'm going to give the armor to you, but then you must personally put it on. The second thing is, is by virtue of the way that Paul puts that, he's saying, you know what? You don't have to put it on. We have a choice. And not only can we choose to not put it on as a Christian, uh, I cannot imagine why anybody would want to do that. And let me say that your efforts are going to be totally futile and you'll never be able to overcome and you'll never be able to stand. Uh, but not only that, even if you do put it on, you don't have to keep it on. So here the idea is that Paul is, is telling us this soldier, uh, senior soldier of the Lord, that yeah, God has given it to you, but make sure that you put it on and that you keep it on. Church, I've said it before, but... A lot of Christians, they wonder why they're not as victorious, they're not as joyful, they're not as, as glorious, they don't see the blessings as much as they want or they feel that God has given to them. They're living under beneath their benefits and their true privileges as a child of God and they wonder why. And a lot of it is, is that, that we do not understand this simple precept that God makes so many things 
things available to us, but we're the one that has to latch on to them. We're the one that by a personal act we have to do. And if we don't do it, if we just sit around and say, Lord, here I am. I'm waiting on you to do it. I'm waiting on you to do it. Uh, God's not going to do it. It's a personal application of this. If you're like me, sometimes it's hard to find that balance in serving God as to what is God's responsibility and what is my responsibility. What, what does God want me to do or when does he want me to stand back and do nothing? And it's not always easy to ascertain that in a given situation or even in a given battle. Because you remember the children of Israel, when they uh, were crossing the Red Sea, they were between a rock and a hard place. And Pharaoh's army was behind them and the Red Sea was in front of them. And, and they were walled in by these cliffs on, on both sides. But do you remember what the Lord told Moses in Exodus there, in Exodus 14 and verse 13? I think you understand and you remember what he says. He says, stand, but stand still. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And the word salvation there a lot of times in, in the word of God, it doesn't mean saving our souls, but it means deliverance. Stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. In that when you, you're in this battle, you're in this struggle, and there's nothing that you can do, but the Lord didn't tell them to fire one shot. They simply were to stand and observe. God said, I want you to stand. I want you to watch. I want you to learn your lessons. I don't want you to miss it. I want you to see the power of the Lord and the abilities of God. And I don't want you to do anything. I simply want you to stand and observe and see. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for those times? When the Lord says, there's no part for you in this situation. Then we remember when they crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land. And they were going to have to take the, uh, the promised land that God had given to them. And, and this place. And, and you remember there in Joshua that the first place was Jericho. And the walls around Jericho are, are memorable. They were wide and they were tall and virtually impregnable, especially for the children of Israel because at this time they had no military weapons. They had just come out of Egypt, but they came out with other stuff. But they did not have any military weapons. And yet, what did the Lord tell them to do? He said, I'm going to give it to you. And you see there in Joshua, in 6 and 6, he talks and tells the priests that he wants them to blow their trumpets as they go around, uh, you know, for seven days, walk around the wall. And then, uh, I didn't give this to you, but in verse 20... It where it actually says that when they went on the seventh day, the seventh time around, the priest blew the trumpets and the people shouted. And what happened? The wall fell down from the very, you know, top to the bottom. Just like the, the uh, uh, veil in the temple that was rent, not from the bottom to the top, as you would think if man does it, uh, but when God does it, from the top to the bottom. And it was as if there was, they detonated like they do today where they want to bring old buildings down that they strategically place the dynamite or whatever it is that they use and they, they put it on the bottom so that and, and all kind of up. And so when it starts, it continues and it falls basically. You know, it, it comes from the bottom and it falls straight down. But it, the top is what falls straight, straight down instead of falling over. It's God. 
You remember when David, and i gotta got to be careful here in these stories. They're so wonderful, but I want you to remember them, and I know that you already do. But you remember that when David went out against Goliath, that there in 1 Samuel 17, in verse 25, first of all, he said, Goliath, you know, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to you. How? In the name of the Lord. And then a few verses later, he says, Hey, Goliath, I want you to know that the battle is the Lord's. Hallelujah. It isn't mine, but it's the Lord's. So I, I want us to see that there are times that God says, you just stand still. But still in the midst of all of that, we are in a battle. And even though the battle is the Lord's, and even though that, that uh, God tells us to stand still, He still tells us, put on the whole armor of God. That's what you have to do. Put on the whole armor of God. I'm, I'm reminded as well, and I didn't give Ken this scripture either, but as uh, we have looked out in our, in our study in Revelation, you remember when Jesus is coming back at the end of the tribulation and to fight that last battle, the battle of Armageddon, the Bible said he's on his steed, his horse, and the armies of the Lord follow after him on their horses. But I want you to notice the contrast there, if you would. And, and when you turn over there, if you remember, it says, we are clothed with white raiments. We don't have the armor on. It doesn't tell us. You know why? Because we're not going to be doing any fighting. We're just along for the ride. Hallelujah. The Bible says the Lord will tread the winepress alone. That's one of the, the prophecies and that he's going to be the one that does the fighting. But the point of the matter is, is that regardless what, whether the Lord doesn't completely force or whether we're like David, even though the battle is the Lord's, David was the one that picked up those stones out of the brook and his sling. And he was the one that ran into the battle. So we see that there is something for us to do. There's that old song that says, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? The writer said, no, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. Well, you could change that just a little bit as it relates to our topic. Must Jesus fight the battle alone and all the church go free? No, there's a battle for everyone, and there's a battle personally for me. And because of that... We've got to uh, apply the armor of the Lord. Let's go on. In this little phrase where Paul says, put on, what's that next word? Did he say, put on the armor of the Lord? But in both cases, he says, put on the, the whole armor of the Lord. Ah, that's important. If we're going to put it on, we've got to put on the whole armor of God. And he mentions that two times within a short span of time so that, that we will get it put on and then taken to yourself. The whole, the whole, the whole armor of God. Now we understand that the armor came in pieces and it was not, uh, you know, all attached together as, as one. That when you put it on, you automatically had everything on. You know, it's, it's not like one of those, uh, they have them for children, but I think they have them for adults too, those hoodie footy pajamas. You know, you have the feet. You're covered. 
That's not how the armor was. That you put on one piece and you're done. No, there's several components to it. And he's saying when you're putting it on, you've got to make sure that you're going to get all of it put on there. Because you see, if one place is vulnerable and left exposed, then you are still vulnerable to the attack and to even spiritual death, the devil's dastardly deed and desire to kill, steal, and destroy. He's a murderer from the beginning. And so that's why that we have to put on the whole armor of God. I, I like what, what, what Peter says, uh, actually. He gives us some uh, intelligence about our, our enemy and our adversary. But in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter says something like this. I want you to be sober. I want you to be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is walking about, notice that next word, seeking whom he may devour. Why does the, Lord, the devil have to search for somebody to devour. If there are 7.5 plus billion with a B people upon this earth, and everywhere we go, you're going to basically see somebody, why does he have to search out? There's people everywhere. Why is he seeking? Well, number one, those that he has already gotten are in the process of devouring them. Those that are not followers of Christ, he doesn't seek them out because he already has them. And then there are Christians who are totally covered with the armor of the Lord, and he knows he cannot touch them either. So what he is searching for, remember, the devil is not God. He is not omniscient. He does not know all things. And so with he and his army, he has them out watching our lives. And they are looking and they are seeking for any chink in the armor. They are seeking for any place of vulnerability. Maybe some place that we have not covered ourselves with a piece of the armor appropriately. That's what he is seeking for. That's what he is looking for. He knows that we are nothing in, a, in and of ourselves against him. That we can never stand. But if we truly take on all that God has given unto us the devil knows that he can roar and he can make a lot of noise and he can maybe afflict us and do all sorts of things but ultimately he cannot destroy my faith in God can somebody say amen, amen. and so that's what he's looking for he's looking for those that are Christians or claim to be Christians and that have not put the armor, the whole armor of God on. I don't know if you hunt. I know we live in such a crazy day that, you know, animal rights and all of that stuff. But God said that he had placed those there and several places in the word of God for the benefit of mankind. But if you hunt with a bow, and I start to say somebody's name, but maybe I better not. <laughs> you know, when you bow hunt, you may see that big monster buck coming way out in the distance, but you don't just up and start firing away. No. Your chances of success is z zilch, zero. So you wait and maybe you call or maybe you rattle. I, I don't know a whole lot about it. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, you do all of that to, to bring them in closer. What you are waiting for is an open shot. And that's what the devil is waiting for, church. That's what he's seeking for. That's what he's watching. He's waiting. He stalks us. And he's waiting for that when we make a miscue, deliberately go against God, or whatever the case may be, we deliberately don't put on our armor, or maybe we have put it on and we've taken it off. Uh, we have exposed ourselves and put a bullseye on us. I remember uh, one of my favorite uh, cartoons uh, was, I uh, can't even think of, the, of, of what it was now, The Far Side. And he had, uh, he had two deer with big, big antlers on, and they're standing on their back feet with their white bellies exposed. And the one goes up to the other. The one has a big old uh, um, target on his stomach. And he goes up and he says, Bummer of a birthmark, Hal. <laughs> So that's what the devil's waiting for. He's waiting for us to expose ourselves, as it were, and where the shot is so much easier for him, so much, so much easy for him. So put on the whole armor of God. You know, if you, if you go into military battle now where grenades and rocket launchers and uh, personal, all of that, uh, you know, it may blow an individual to pieces. But somebody said, you don't have to blow an individual to smithereens to destroy them. The way God made us is he didn't make us with a bunch of pockets of blood to supply blood just to that one area of our body. But our heart pumps our blood throughout the extremities. Of. So if you wound somebody in the shoulder and that continues to bleed, it doesn't mean that you've shot them in the head or you've shot them in the foot or you shoot them in the hand. It simply means that you've got them at one place and they will bleed out. Are my illustrations too gory here? Maybe they are. But I'm trying to make a point here, church is that all the devil needs is one open shot. One chink in the armor. Remember when Ahab was killed? I mean, there was a, a soldier on a, on a chariot. He just took his bow and he just... Whoosh, and shot. And the Bible said that it went in between Ahab's armor where the two pieces connected. And it says by, by chance, basically. He didn't mean to do it. But the point of the matter is, is that that's, that's all they need. Is that little space, open spot. That's what the enemy is looking for. i got to hurry here and I'm going to finish up. Put on, that's the practical application, the whole armor, that's the proven amount where we're going to be successful and the devil is not. And then the last thing is the powerful author of this armor. Put on the whole armor of rich gold eisen. Nope. Put on the whole armor. If I could go through every one and mention your name as well. And there's sometimes that we think that we can do it in and of ourselves. You know, I, I can I can straighten my life out. I can get all of this together. I I I can do all of this without the help of the Lord, and we cannot. And that's why he says that the powerful author is, is, it is the Lord. And the reason that we need this armor that comes from and that is provided for and supplied for by the Lord and not from any other human being is because Paul tells us in our text, because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. 
but against these demonic spirits and the devil. It's a spiritual battle. Now, if we were fighting a natural battle, then I assume that the M1 Abram tank would be pretty nice to have. If you're fighting a natural battle, that the M4 or the M4A1 carbine may be nice to have. If you're fighting a natural battle in armies such as ours, and especially so close here, which we are honored by and thankful for, but, you know, you may want one of the stealth bomber aircrafts. You may want the B-2 Spirit. You may want the F-35. You may want the 117 Nighthawk. You, you may want all of these. But we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're in a spiritual battle. And if we're in a spiritual battle, we need to take on the spiritual warfare that God has provided for us. I'm closing with this. The Apostle Paul... He talks much in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and, and he says there in verse 3, he said, We walk in the flesh. Yeah, we're, we're you know, you touch me, I'm flesh. I walk in the flesh. <laughs> but he said, we do not war or we do not fight after the flesh. In other words, even though we're in this fleshly body, we do not fight our spiritual battles with flesh artillery. Can you say amen? And he goes on to say in the next verse, he said, for, for our weapons are not carnal, they're not fleshy, they're not uh, physical, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down the utter destruction of strongholds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we are in it to win it. And church, I want to encourage every one of us here today, that is, we will begin to, next week, the Lord willing, to begin to talk about the various individual components of this and how that we need to put all of them on so that we are fully protected. Thank God that we can be in it, but in it to win it. Put on the whole armor of God. What a statement. The practical application, the proven amount, and the powerful Author, giver, commander, captain of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you again for another day. I thank you again for another time to be able to spend in the word of the Lord. God, I want to win. I want to be in it to win it. I don't want to be in it and just struggle and flail. And crawl. And try to make it through another day. Lord, we acknowledge the battle is fierce, hot and heavy, and we are on the front line. But Lord, even in spite of all of that, we are in it to win it, to be victorious. So thank you, Lord, that as your men of God were tender to the Holy Spirit in writing 
the word of the Lord and what you wanted us to know many years later. But I pray that we will take their heed. But God, help us today to understand that when it comes to spiritual warfare, that out of all that you have given us to ensure there's not one thing left undone or left unsupplied that we're wondering when you're going to give it to us so we can be fully victorious. No, Lord, it's already been given. If I'm not victorious the way that you want me to be, maybe it's because I haven't taken that last article and maybe I haven't personally applied it by faith to my own life. Lord, I can't apply the armor for those here that sit before me. Neither can they apply the armor of the Lord to me. I have to do it personally. They have to do it personally. And so, Lord, as we are about to come around this altar, I pray that even though maybe we've already done it, I want us to reapply. I want us to redo it. And I want us to say, Lord, I want to apply the whole armor of God as I stand here before this altar in your presence. And Lord, I want to keep it on for the duration. Daily, I want to make sure that everything is tight. There is not the slightest crack or chink or separation that leaves me vulnerable. So Lord, help us here today. And I'll give you the praise for we ask it in the name of Jesus.